everybody. Welcome to the Circle of Brilliance. This is T. Falcon Napier. We are going to continue our discussion on uh, the uh, neurotransmitters. Um, after last week's call, someone sent me a question, and I'm hoping you guys would find this question an interesting one to explore as well. It goes back to how we depicted the, um, the spread for dopamine and the spread for serotonin uh, on the change grid. And the question that came up was this. Because dopamine is associated with addiction and uh, serotonin is viewed as kind of the, the opposite of serotonin, I forget what we were, the reciprocal kind of uh, neurotransmitter, is it true or could it be true that one of the ways to treat people who are addicted to whatever might be to take a look at what's going on with their serotonin. So do these SSRIs help someone who is in an addictive sort of a situation? Um, and so what, what background, I know several of you have medical backgrounds and a neurochemical backgrounds. So any, any thoughts on that? Um, I can weigh in, even though I don't have medical background, but taught psychology. Um, um, in the conversational intelligence work, um, Judith Glazer found that when we have collaborative relationships, trusting relationships, and are, are vulnerable, it produces serotonin and oxytocin for bonding. And when we don't trust someone, it produces cortisol. Mm. And, so, um, um, and so thus, somebody could say the right word, but if we don't trust them, it, we're still going to um, have cortisol and be defensive. Interesting. And so... Um, that would then mean that um, that person might be someone who we wouldn't be trusting to help us with whatever the situation was. Is exactly, that or be yeah. influenced, right. And um, right. I read a great book by um, uh, um, Robert Ludwig, uh, Lustig, and um, he even found that if we get information we don't agree with or don't have a belief system, it produces cortisol. So thus, if I have a favorite news station and then I hear something that doesn't agree with my belief system, I'll get angry. Interesting. And so, you know, when we earlier in this grand series for uh, the um, um, you know, attention management during uh, the coronavirus pandemic, we talked about bias. And isn't it interesting that a bias would then stimulate whatever neurotransmitters would be involved in supporting the continuation of that bias? Yes. Um, and does that also mean then that if the neurotransmitters are just out of whack for some other reason, organic or whatever, that it's going to carry uh, certain changes in bias along with it? I think so. Kind of like a philosopher said, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. So that it, it affects our perception. So if I'm depressed, I'm going to see those things that are going to mirror how I feel. And then I may act in a way to make other people behave to justify how I feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very so, interesting. Yeah. There's another interesting aspect of this from Judith Glazer's work, and that is the notion of conversations in which we signal both trust and distrust in the same conversation. Um, and so she has um, a, a catalyst tool, which has five elements that supposedly conversational rituals that supposedly would um, support the production of oxytocin, and conversely, those that would support the um, um, production of cortisol. And so one example, and, and you can look at your bar graph and see how many of those conversational elements you have and what the pair bonds can be. And mm -hmm. an example would be, um, I know that my manager really cares about me because he's, he's scheduling these one-on-ones weekly. And so there's that whole sense of, being, of feeling that there's concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in that meeting, he's constantly looking aside at the iPhone for a text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is the brain is toggling back and forth um, between, you know, is this a, do I trust or do I not trust here? And it's getting these kinds of mixed messages. Exactly. And, 
And in fact, that's even talked about in a lot of the work on neurolinguistic programming that we are receiving information about another person through multiple pathways. So there's a visual pathway, there's an auditory pathway, there's a, a physical pathway. So we're, we're getting all this information. And so we talk about, well, where, where is it more likely to encounter misrepresentation or lies? And so the answer was that words end up being far less trustworthy than and what we observe with our own eyes. And so while he might be saying, hey, I'm here to support you and care about you, etc., his body language is telling you something entirely different. And the belief would be the body language is probably telling you something that is more accurate, more truthful, more reliable than what the words would be saying. Yeah, that's why I said to you um, that dopamine the relationship between dopamine and serotonin has a push-pull kind of relationship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so dopamine cares less about if your reward or motivation is value driven mm -hmm. dopamine simply wants more dopamine mm -hmm. so it'll push you in a direction and push you to the edges where you're taking risks because you're more interested in that reward However, when serotonin kicks in, it's going to pull you back center. You're going, to, mm -hmm. you, you're going to reflect on things. And that's why I said, you know, dopamine connects, uh, pairs well with um, testosterone and estrogen, whereas serotonin is impacted by oxytocin. So they, they interact from one another because oxytocin is secreted in the same region as serotonin in the pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. So that's why they affect one another. Interesting. And, and again, you know, the, this question came up just because the person was just wondering when people who are really working with an addicted population, do they stop and say, we should probably find out what's going on with this person's serotonin? Because is the addiction um, kind of a side effect of uh, poor serotonin uh, reuptake? Uh, or is it something totally independent? So is one involved in the other? And I, of course, have nothing um, to, to share of any meaning on that one. I, so I thought I'd throw it to you guys and just see, well, yeah. I wonder, I wonder. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so any other thoughts you have on that, do feel free to share them at some point. Uh, today, I'd like to move on to GABA. And so going back to our little chart here, GABA is a calming neurotransmitter. It calms firing nerves in the central nervous system. High levels improve focus. Low levels cause anxiety. Also contributes to motor control and vision. That's a lot. Um, and so I put together just a, kind of a, a working um, diagram we can play with here. And if we can just take some of those things at face value, maybe just maybe we can figure out how GABA might uh, be uh, found at different locations on the change grid in different concentrations. So before we do that, Brian, would you like to give us more of a background understanding of GABA? Yeah, when you talk about GABA and glutamate, glutamate um, is the precursor for GABA. Mm -hmm. So when the body secretes uh, too much glutamate, it will form GABA. Mm -hmm. And GABA is, uh, think about it as the brakes for the brain itself. Mm -hmm. So it's going to like impact all these other neurochemicals and uh, neurotransmitters because when you talk about glutamate and GABA, they impact the signaling of the neurons communicating with each other. <laughs> so in combination, they, you know, GABA is the, the, the most important uh, inhibitory, whereas glutamate is one of the most important excitatory uh, transmitters. So as, as it says there, when you have low GABA, that you see anxiety, is the chronic stress, because GABA will do the exact opposite, depression, uh, difficulty concentrating and memory problems, muscle pain, headaches, insomnia, because it, it has a lot to do with your sleep cycles as well. This is a supplement that people actually take. 
Oh, because GABA is a gamma, it stands for gamma aminobutyric acid. So um, uh, you can take also a supplement called glutamine. Mm -hmm. So these are amino acids. So they really impact the cells functioning in terms of signaling and communicating. With and one is another. it one of like the, the 20, is it 21 essential amino acids or is that just what proteins are built from? So. Right, because they, they serve as, you know, amino acids are like the building blocks for protein. So that's yeah. why the, they uh, help with the signaling of the cells. Interesting. Well, then let me, let me uh, take a look at this diagram and see if what we're um, about to do is going to hold true. And I'll do this by asking you guys a quiz question. So all of you that are muted, feel free to chime in if you feel so inclined. Where on the change grid is someone most calm? And um, I think as you start to answer that question, we might need to take a look at how do we define calm? So are we defining calm as far as physical uh, terms are concerned? Is it calming ourselves emotionally? Is it calming ourselves as far as intellectual processing? Are those all one in the same? Are they in different locations? And, and so uh, I'll just throw that to you guys. What, what do you guys think? Where does calm live on the change grid? Gotta live in the center, doesn't it? <laughs> that, that's both a statement and a question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're asking all of that, I, I can't imagine it living anywhere but the center. Well, if you use it as an avoidance strategy, it can be way in grid because you're just not engaging. So the center, you're paying attention to what's going on, you're considering options. So you're centered, which is calm, but there's another form of calm, which is kind of an addiction which is you don't engage and then you're, you're calm, you're just not, nothing's happening. So that would be very ingrid. Yeah, in fact, I'm gonna start moving a few things around just to see if we can play with this a little bit. So, so engaged calm is, is at the center because you're, you're paying attention, you're engaged, not in the activity level, at least you're consciously aware. But if you go way inward, your awareness is down but you might be calm if it's a physiological thing. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. avoiding. Oh, that's wrong. It's this one. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, so let's take a look at both of those things, and I'm going to throw in a third. Uh, but so let's see, Jane, you've also unmuted. I was just going to say it depends on the definition of calm, which you know is just repeating what everybody else has said. So true. What do we mean by calm? What yeah. do we mean by calm? And so certainly I think that, we, and so let's talk about each of our definitions of calm and see if that comes into play. And then maybe one of you can tell us what the medical uh, or the neuroscience definition of calm really is. I'll bet it has more to do with neuron activity, neuronal activity than anything else. But nevertheless, um, when I'm at the center of the change grid, I'm supposed to be finding that zen, blissful, balanced, harmonious, detached, winds of heaven dancing around me. That feels really quite calm. I'm not, I'm not really actively doing anything, but I can be aware of whatever's going on around me, but I'm in a moment of peace and balance and a bit of tranquility. Um, but I'm, I'm conscious, I'm aware, all that good stuff is happening. And so I can certainly see that that, that would hold true. And if it's that the higher the level of GABA, the more that feeling of calm would be uh, realized and that's really, that really holds true. And then if I look at the rest of it, they say that it's also high levels improve focus. So when I'm in the center of the change grid, I am certainly able to focus if focus means to see things clearly. Mm -hmm. But if focus means to direct my attention in a very um, confined way, that's not the center of the change grid. That's someplace else. Well, for me, you said a very important word, uh, balance, uh, because mm -hmm. GABA is an important uh, contributor to the body's overall mental and physical homeostasis or balance. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a key word that you just used there. Mm -hmm. All right. And so I think, are we in agreement that what we're showing on the diagram here feels right? We at least know this part of what we're looking at is true, feels true, yeah? Yeah. See, this is um, Peter with maybe a question and a comment to throw out there. 
um, isn't a lot of this also determined how well we take care of ourselves, such as sleep, stress management, eating right, exercise, et cetera, that if we're not doing self-care, we tend to be less resilient, thus more stressed. Right, and I think that brings up a, a really interesting question. That is that, do does can I deliberately do those things to get the right bowl of neurotransmitter soup happening, or is it my neurotransmitter soup that's actually making me more restful, more calm, etc.? I already know what Brian's going to say. He's going to say it works both directions. <laughs> yeah, so. and, and exactly right. And Peter asked a very uh, important question because you got to remember for all of these neurotransmitters and the way they interact with one another, we have these baselines right? And so when we're training ourselves in a certain way, uh, the baseline becomes kind of uh, a human algorithm. So until we actually change the algorithm, then we're going to get the same output. Uh -huh. So that's why it's important to understand what's going on with ourselves physically, intellectually, or emotionally, because there's something underneath it. See, these things become what in neuroscience, we used to call them an app, affectionately. Mm -hmm. And an app is an, a, um, an association, a pattern, a program, or a process. So there's an app for everything that we do mentally. There's an app for everything we do emotionally. There's an app for everything we do physically. And we will run these programs. Might my programs be different than somebody else's? My, yeah, my, my that's be different. That it'll be it, it'll be different, and in 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 the sense that the way you're experiencing it could be different. Because remember, each one of these neurotransmitters connect with a receptor and or a hormone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Transmitters are short lived, whereas when we talk about GABA and and things like glutamate, we're talking about neuropeptides. So they have that hormonal effect, and those are long lasting. They're slow. Mm -hmm. Same thing when it comes to like serotonin and, and how I said serotonin has shares a relationship with oxytocin. So those are slow moving and they're potent when we talk about something that's a neuropeptide. They're very potent. They're more so potent than uh, a neurotransmitter. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. And so then oxytocin and cortisol, these are, these are not neurotransmitters as much as they are what other category would they be in? I think, isn't oxytocin a hormone? Yeah, they're hormonal. So okay. they're, they're classified as a neural ho hormone. Okay, all right. All right, so back to uh, my, uh, my, my, uh, my concern about how we're defining something. As Tom said, calmness can also be a coping mechanism. So is it the appearance of being calm, trying your best to project that you are calm? Um, or is it? Is there a difference between that and being genuinely calm? I'm sure the answer and, and is And yes. even the word detachment and focus are different. So, so if you did enough morphine, you'd be calm and you'd be detached, but it's not the same of kind of detachment as meditation. Right, 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 right. Trying to physically separate myself or emotionally separate yeah, myself. Yeah, you're creating a state that we could call calmness, but you're really not in the world. You're not engaged in any way. Right. And so, um, and I would say that there is still an element of disturbance underlying that you wouldn't bother employing a coping strategy if there wasn't something that you were trying to cope with. Well, but it's deferred. Okay, tell us about that. Well, so when you think about AA one day at a time, there isn't mm -hmm. a single drunk that's worried about how they're going to get the money to buy their alcohol on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. They're only living one day at a time to get whatever that drug is. Mm -hmm. So the strategy, and even really not being so stark, procrastination is a strategy to, do, to engage some other time with whatever mm -hmm. you fear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So whether you use drugs or not, I think that particular kind of calm, and it is an artificial calm, it's not mm -hmm. sustainable, but you are calm in that moment. You wouldn't mm -hmm, say mm -hmm. somebody that did op opioids wasn't really calm. Right. Uh, but one could say that someone who's, you know, smoking pot is calm in that moment. Yeah, so mm. it's deferring the, yeah. and so you could say that about meditation, but it's an entirely different intention around the detachment. Right, 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 right. 
Can I add another dimension too at the please. risk? Please, please. <laughs> um, I've, I've been rereading uh, Martin Seligman's Learned Optimism, and mm -hmm. what I'm getting is that the essence of it is is how we frame things. Yes. So if I frame things like this is awful, it's terrible, I can become depressed and anxious, and that's my biochemistry, the cortisol, et cetera, is impacted. Or I could say, you know what? What doesn't kill me makes me stronger, and every challenge is a real opportunity, and that could also change my biochemistry and help me be more resilient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. See, remember yeah. we talked about last time how basically we can say the nervous system itself is interested in five things. The sensation, the perception, feelings, the thoughts, and the actions, aka behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. And so exactly what Peter just described um, is going four for four. So you, you sensations, again, is non-negotiable. Non because we have receptors all throughout our body. That's how we experience the external world through our, our senses. So <laughs> the body doesn't need you to figure that out for you. You're already designed for that, right? <laughs> but when Could it you repeat those five things again? The nervous system is concerned with five? Yeah, the sensation. So that's those receptors that go throughout our bodies. That's the five mm -hmm. senses, uh, the perception, so now we're getting into the psychological factors that the nervous system, the neurons uh, help us figure out. So perception, the feelings and the thoughts, and then the actions. So our behaviors. What so Peter is talking about is, is perception. So I'm feeling nervous and I say, I'm really excited. And that moves me into it rather than I'll call in sick. Exactly. So uh -huh, uh -huh. Exactly. Because think that's about like a, a, a adrenaline drunk junkie that we were talking about on like the last uh, uh, call, right? So uh -huh. adrenaline junkie, again, dopamine simply wants more dopamine, doesn't care if it's value driven or not. But where this push pull comes in, so adrenaline junkie gets hurt because they took too much risk. Now, all of a sudden, they have to step back and reflect on this idea. Okay, I, I really enjoy this activity, but I might need to think about this a little bit more. My family is important to me. That's going to pull them back in. They may still get involved in the activity, but it's going to reframe, uh, reframe and reshape, the, refashion the way that they go about it now. So just like an achiever can be an achiever, but you know, as you get older, the, the reasons you achieve why you achieve, how you achieve shifts. That mm -hmm. shifts the whole neural, neural uh, transmitter soup, if you will, underneath mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Well, and certainly, you know, not that we need to keep repeating it, but this is all driven by people's perceptions of whatever's really going on. Even as Brian was talking about how our physical senses, our physical senses are detecting whatever they're detecting, but that detection um, is then interpreted in a different sort of a way. Uh, like, for example, um, we have a, have a, a friend in North Carolina who is in the, um, the, the tree business. So he's an arborist. And so he's out in, in our garden and he takes his hands and he captures a bee. And we're kind of going like, why are you not like, why are you not freaking out? You are holding a bee in your hand. And he goes, he goes, well, yeah, this is a male. It doesn't have a stinger. And we're kind of going like, who knew that? And so it's like, because my perceptions of, of that bee even moving around were going to trigger a very different set of responses than what was really going on. Or I never understood the people who want to touch a candle's flame. So it's like, does your body's telling you that's hot, but they're going like, yeah, but we perceive it, you know, differently. It's more, you know, we're more interested in it than, than we are harmed by it. So... Uh, so I guess I'm throwing that out as a question. Is it also true then that our perceptions can change the way that physical information is received, processed, and acted upon? T, I can respond to that. Um, years ago in a former lifetime, I sold pharmaceuticals. One of the drug was um, buprenorphine for pain management. And, you know, we would promote it as an alternative that was more potent than morphine and twice, twice as long lasting, et cetera. 
and 50% of the time it worked, 50% it didn't work. And when the doctors or the surgeon said, we have something more potent than morphine, do you wanna try it? They'd say, bring it on and it worked. But when you had a resident or a fellow or another surgeon just not um, um, introduce it that way, they just, well, we're giving you this instead of morphine, then they would erupt like, what the blank be blank did you give me? This is blank be blank water. Um, mm -hmm. So their perception of the drug impacted whether or not it, they would get pain relief. Right, an expectation of, an, of yeah. an impact, yeah. So the placebo effect. Yes, yeah. yes. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, all right, other thoughts about, uh, about uh, what we're talking about here as far as uh, the presence of GABA as a coping mechanism? Because I have one other thing I want to throw out to the to the mix. Okay, well we can come back to it if you guys have other thoughts around it. But one of the things that was brought up was that uh, GABA improves focus. High levels improve focus. Where on the change grid would someone be most focused? Slightly up and out. So one thing we could certainly say is if they are up and out, they could be focused. Where else might they be very focused? Down and out. Down and out, because that would be that, um, uh, right. see again, and I'm looking at this engagement ring right here. So this is where engagement really is. Well, engagement and focus are, um, may not be synonyms, but they're definitely neighbors. And so they're focused. And I also think that the person who's just plain out grid mm -hmm. is also very focused. Can I build the case that um, a person who is in a life or death situation is very focused? Or is the truth that the kind of focus or the definition of focus at each of these uh, different locations is different? See, I think the person who's in the very top is not necessarily focused. That's in, if that's in the panic mode where you're not focused. So in order to move down, I mean, you need to move down grid to allow yourself or to help yourself be more focused. Right, because up there you're just being reactive. The focus right. is mm -hmm. more instinctual than you, you know. Now, now we're talking about focus as being more of a conscious, deliberate, An active, yeah, active. A choice that's being made. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, see, the, so I went like, well, is the center of the change grid a place of focus as well? I mean, you might be focused on different things, but is that also focus? What are your guys' thoughts on that one? Well, if you think about meditation, uh, meditation is intense focus, you know, focus on the breath or focus on, you can um, move, train yourself to move your focus around the body for uh, different, di in, for different things, either sensations or, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Or, or visualization. Visualization. Is also yeah. visualization. So, yeah, I would agree that the center has a focus a aspect there. Yeah, we have a nice little dark spot there, but I don't know that it's giving us the right range of impact. Isn't the difference key, though, when we're talking about meditation in the center, the focus is internal and it's mm -hmm. a consciousness within, and the other focus is external mm -hmm. it seems like everything that everybody's saying depends on internal focus or external to me i think that you're right Edie, because if i'm here and i'm that expressive driver driven mm -hmm. expressive i'm mm -hmm. focusing on something external and trying to understand it adapt to it etc obviously if i am a driven driver and i'm out here in strong execution and um um, engagement well I'm definitely focused and certainly if I'm downgrade we describe that as the focus of a of a scientist at a microscope totally lost in whatever the work is that they're getting done all three of those are external uh, have, have a strong external involvement but an internal commitment to focusing on whatever that external um, situation might have been might be 
Yeah, but I think GABA can still help in those other areas with the exception of, as Jane was describing, the upgrade, because remember, most, most of dopamine is this external chase mm -hmm. for some kind of uh, motivation or war to happen mm -hmm. for you to experience that. So it's the same thing. And what GABA does, it, it's, it, it will bring it back down. So it will suppress it so right. that you, know, you, you can start to at least begin to focus and or think about what it is that you're actually doing. Okay, good. And see, that takes me then to my next little question where it says that, um, that it's a calming neurotransmitter. Well, you'll have to help me understand what it's calming because I don't think someone who is a driven, expressive, expressive driver, that doesn't really resonate with calm. There's a lot of intensity around that uh, that mindset certainly the person who is here out grid there's a lot of drive there's a lot of intensity and similarly although it's quiet the person who's quite far uh, down grid is also um i don't know that i would describe calm there what do you guys think does it need to be both i mean can it can gaba uh basically um, reflect different kinds of expressions. I mean, it doesn't, calm doesn't necessarily, calm can sit alongside of focus, mm -hmm. the driven focus. I, mean, I don't know, I'm asking the question of the neuroscientists, but it, it, it sounds like there are so many different aspects of GABA that it's, that it's very versatile. And I'm not certain that it's one or the other, but it's a combination of them. And that's my question. That very well could be a combination of it because you got to remember we all have different baselines. So my calm might be uniquely different than someone else's calm. You know, I very rarely find myself uh, up grid uh, in terms of tension. Um, mm -hmm. So I have a high tolerance for that. Um, but you know, for someone else, it, they they might have a, a shorter threshold, if you will. So. Um, certainly it can be both. The, the thing that GABA is most concerned with is the homeostasis, whatever that homeostasis is for you. And see, when I talk about these baselines, some of them are biological and some of them are the ones that we trained ourselves to be. For instance, 98.6 is biological. If you go above or below that, that gives you know physicians like myself indication of what's going on with you, and you'll you'll start to experience that. Like physiologically, something will happen to your body. So when we talk about these five things that the nervous system is primarily concerned with, that's interoception, and it's always trying to balance these interoceptive states, these internal states, with something exterioceptive. So it's always trying to balance that. But again, everyone has a different baseline and homeostasis in terms of that. So it's, got, it's hard to regulate that as opposed to one against the other, if that makes sense. My question, Brian, about that is, is calm and is, can you be, is calm and focused necessarily the same thing, even if people, you know, in other words, is there a, just a different kind of uh, characteristic that that GABA uh, reflects or predicts or whatever, um, does it need to be one thing? Uh, can it be calm and or focus as opposed to any one thing, just calm? Let, let me throw something into that because I want to, I want to, uh build on what you said earlier, Kathy, and that said, maybe there's a combination of things going on. And I think we all understand that these are all ingredients in a bowl of soup. So they're all working together. They're all happening. So now I wanted to slide, slide into place, but for some reason, my PowerPoint is doing its little spinny thing and nothing's functioning. But what I, oh, now it's working. How did that happen? <laughs> Oh my goodness, I wanted to say, wait a second, let's slide dopamine back into our little game here. And if I said, well, what is GABA like in the presence of high levels of dopamine? Or what is GABA like when it is in the presence of high levels of serotonin? 
maybe that's part of what of what's really coming into play here. So that serotonin and all the good things that come along with it ends up um, employing, activating, I don't know what the verb would be, but uh, the GABA performs differently than it might otherwise. So am I making stuff up, uh, Brian, or might I have something? Uh, that's what I said. It's, it's, it's uh, like the brakes, if you will, for the brain. Like GABA is used uh, in the emergency room. We use it to help control someone's blood pressure, right? So it's, it's bringing it back again into homeostasis. So they have this really, really high blood pressure. GABA will bring it back down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it has that kind of relationship with these other neurotransmitters. It's trying to regulate, if you will, them into their homeostasis point. Yeah. Does that so, make sense? It, it does. And so let me just ask this. When we're talking about focus, do you think that focus is the same as being transfixed on something or obsessed by something or is focused more of a healthy way of uh, directing our attention? Could I yeah. inject? Yeah, oh, go sorry, right ahead, Brian. Peter. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, Brian. No, go ahead, Peter. Okay, I, the thought that, the hit that I got on that is, is the term self-mastery and that is how do I be present with all of my emotions but then able to activate, let's say, discipline and focus even though there's uncertainty around me and I'm not certain of the outcome. So to me, I think some of this could be cultivated by whatever disciplines we do to develop mindfulness, presence, and, and master our emotions so we can manage them rather than be driven by them. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and see, what you've just said would tell me I need to move these circles closer to closer. center. Yeah, exactly. That makes sense. You know what? And it's a matter of choice. It, it's what's in control. So if I'm OCD, then I'm not in control, but I'm very focused. I, I may be driven with fear of, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what might happen. So I think it comes down to, um, I choose, therefore I am free kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so far, GAB has been the most interesting one, got to tell you. But I like the idea about it says if it's calming and by calming, if it means that I'm finding a certain level of, um, of uh, not see peace isn't the right word. We need a different word for what this is, but I might have something I need to focus on, but I'm calm in my pursuit of that understanding. Uh, or I might be that analytical driver who's really figuring something out, but I'm calm. I don't feel any sort of a, a threat around it or anything like that. And even if I'm upgrade here, again, this is the domain of romance, that expressive driver driven expressive. Um, I'm, I'm focused on something, but I can still have a certain level of calm around it. But true calm is at the center of the change grid, at least how we define it. And I just wanted to throw one thing out there. Wouldn't we say people that are down in apathy are calm? Or is that, that not really calm as much as it's just um, <laughs> inactive? I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, cl clueless as opposed to <laughs> yeah, or just kind of like disengaged or whatever. Yeah, um, so. You know, the other thing that was talked about for GABA was about high levels, low levels cause anxiety. I thought that was an interesting verb that they chose to say causes anxiety as opposed to it doesn't calm anxiety the anxiety is there but without the GABA you're going to feel it instead of not feel it well okay my, my uh, thing is doing its spinning routine again but I want you guys to tell me where does anxiety live on the change grid where does depression live on the change grid because often we, we hear people that are psychologists use those terms in, in combination like they're like they're the same thing or like they're neighbors so where do you think depression lives on the change grid where do you think anxiety lives on the change grid i think depression lives down grid depression lives down grid and maybe in grid maybe yeah, slightly in grid yeah and anxiety anxiety probably up grid up grid yeah. So when I think of that, I go, well, um, if I am feeling anxious, 
that means there's some sort of an anticipation of something's going to happen or my there's a fantasy that it is happening or maybe it is happening so there is something that's going on and that's what i'm being anxious about whether it's real or imagined current or at some point in the future or whatever i think that that whole drama is an upgrade sort of script um where depression, and I even think about depression as being on the physical and uh, biochemical side of things, things aren't moving. I'm not moving. Um, so my serotonin, we already know, is, is, is not being uh, moved the way it needs to be moved for me to fee be feeling better. So I'm depressed, and I'm depressed physically. I'm depressed emotionally. I'm depressed intellectually. That feels very downgrid to me. And so... And I guess this is for uh, the, the, those that really know what this what GABA does. If I don't have very much GABA, am I only going to have my anxiety issues aggravated? Or is a low level of GABA also associated with depression? Yeah, it's definitely associated with depression, chronic stress, um, like I say, difficulty with the concentration or memory problems, but also insomnia and other sleep problems. Mm -hmm. So again, the way that GABA interact with these other cells is, is helping them to communicate. And so it's going to bring it back down when they're so-called beyond their baseline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to do that for all of these neurotransmitters. So it's considered as the major uh, inhibitory, whereas glutamate is the major excitatory. Okay, and so let me let me uh, ask this then. Would you say that GABA, in large part, maps? I can't click on it, but maps to serotonin. So it's very strong in the center of the change grid. As we go away in any direction, we're going to see it's going to be reduced, with the exception of these three giant purple spots. So it's kind of like more of an outgrid um, impact but it still has a uh, an impact everywhere else on the grid. So am I babbling? Is it an outgrid leaning version of serotonin? I think that we, we, we uh, say, can say yes. How would all that suddenly happen? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, I think we can say yes. <laughs> I love the the emphatic nature of that. You know, obviously, my goal is to try to understand as much as I can about what happens at each part of the change grid. So if I said in the upgrid danger zone, GABA is going to be low. In the mm -hmm. downgrid danger zone, GABA is going to be low. Mm -hmm. uh, in the in-grid danger zone, or maybe in-grid in general, GABA is going to be low. But mm -hmm. as I start to approach the center of the change grid, I get a strong presence of GABA. And based on circumstances, I might get an even bigger boost if I'm in that engagement or that here we have this idea about intention leads to engagement. So I now have an intention and engagement I'm trying to direct my energies towards whatever the outcome may be, would that give me an increase in my GABA? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't make me turn it into a diagram because I will. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So um, is it also true then that GABA and dopamine um, does the presence of GABA always trigger a high level of dopamine or only under certain circumstances? I would say under certain circumstances. Okay, then, then what we're showing here, uh, I, can, I can trust us a little bit. Let me, I'm going to get rid of the dopamine. I'm going to change the color bar for GABA to purple. Oh, sorry, do this, now do this. Uh, and then I'll figure out how to make all that work. But so what we're saying is that there is a certain presence of GABA everywhere. Oops. Or is that not true? Is anyone ever not experiencing any GABA? Brian? No. So it's always there. 
Yes. So, yes. okay, fine. Then we can leave it glutamate. as it is. You, you, glutamate, you have to have um, the right concentration, the right amount at the right time. Like if it's too low or too high, glutamate, something that we naturally produce, will become toxic. And mm. think about it like sh literally short circuiting the brain. So in some, in a worst case scenario, death will happen. So, uh, and would that death be perfect. be a quiet, subtle death or an explosive kind of death? Well, think about it. GABA is used for like um, uh, anti seizure uh, medication, right? All right. So, yeah, so it's trying to balance that out there so that you're not overstimulated, right? And the right. same thing with like glutamate. So it 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 will it will happen uh, gradually, but it's very very painful. It doesn't take long for it when you're depleted of it or it's low. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it'll be interesting to explore that more because when you're talking about, and again, I just switched over to the glutamate uh, um, diagram here, that both extremely high levels and extremely low levels are problematic. Yes, it has to and, be the right way. Because glutamate takes place inside the cell, so it's intracellular, and it has to take place inside the cells. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it, it, the way that it interacts with the other neurotransmitters is it, it releases the right amount of concentration. Yeah. Like it communicates on what's called the dendrites, which are like basically the ears of the neurons. Mm -hmm. So it, it can't be too much or it can't be too little or you short circuit things. And that's where you see a lot of malfunctioning happening. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to end up bringing up a, another question that we'll, uh, we'll explore on Thursday, but are all neurotransmitters um, ultimately going to express themselves in some sort of external observable behavior? Or are some of them happening at such a cellular level that while all kinds of stuff is going on, it does not necessarily manifest itself as a uh, change in external observable behavior. Yeah, see, that's a good question because remember, they are all connected to, uh, you know, nor no neurotransmitter acts as a single actor. They're right. all connected to a receptor or uh, a hormone. So when we're talking about hormone, as I said, they're long lasting. So these are things that you can take someone's blood and figure out what's going on with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are observable. But when you talk about a transmitter like uh, histamine, histamine has a lot to do with um, our everyday sleep uh, awake cycles. So the mm -hmm. ultradian rhythms as they're called. And those things are observable, they're measurable, so you can see these things happen. Breathing, you know, that's something mm -hmm. that's observable. It's measurable. Heart rate. Right, right, right. Um, okay, and so just to kind of finish off our discussion on, on GABA for today. So, Brian, you said earlier, I forget who else said it, that you can actually take a supplement, or is that a supplement for glutamate? You is there a supplement for both. So... Glutamate. It's a supplement for glutamate, but GABA, if you Google it, you, you'll see it, that people take it. I'm not sure it's effecting this. Uh, right, but my question is, if someone took it, would that move them uh, into one of these more purple kind of areas? Would that make us more focused, more directed towards producing our whatever outcomes we want? I, I mean, think I'm, that's why people are taking it, but yeah, I've never seen studies on it, so I'm not yeah. sure of the efficacy of it, but I think that's why they're taking it, and that's certainly that's why it's marketed. Right, to, as something that will increase your crazy. focus, build your... Right. Interesting. Okay, very um, interesting. I'm way in, too. Uh, I would imagine um, it would impact uh, a person's baseline as well as if they feel their life is meaningful. I can't help but think the way they're framing mm -hmm. is my life meaningful and purposeful to yeah. determine, you know, a lot of the biochemistry too. That's um, right. Right. And certainly mission, vision, and purpose, all those sorts of things are living more where these, it, those tend to be more out grid um, sorts of elements as well. And so um, are there foods that then, I mean, uh, if obviously if you can take a pill, they're creating it somehow, some way, is it, present or derived from certain foods? I believe it is because it, it, it does impact uh, or have a role in, or they're researching now, um, 
in gut health. Um, right, because you figure, I mean, everything we got, we ate. <laughs> it's like, yeah, right. <laughs> everything right. we've got, we ate. So, so you, you, you can find it in um, things such as like uh, the cruciferous, like broccoli. Mm -hmm. Broccoli, um, Brussels sprouts, yeah. Thin, Brussels sprouts, those kinds of things, halibut, tomatoes. Mm -hmm. So things that are very, because remember, this is an amino acid. So things that have kind of like um, an acidy kind of, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say taste, but um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, function, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. in the body, the way mm -hmm. the body digests it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. Okay, Kathy, were you about to throw something in? No, no, my, my comment here is, is every time I read about GABA, it's, it has to do with either, um, either a depression related thing at boosting uh, or calming, mm -hmm. but also for sleep. So mm -hmm. that's how people prescribe it. That's how people talk about it. I've never been, I've never taken it. I don't know what it feels like. But yeah. See, that's so interesting because looking at this little, my little diagram here, we don't sleep here. Sleep no, is down yeah. here. <laughs> That's what's interesting. I mean, that's why I wanted to state that. It's very interesting because it's different from what we're describing here. So I don't know. Yeah. Well, and again, maybe it's about how it interacts with another transmitter that's somewhere else. Like I was going to talk about acetylcholine, and it definitely seems to change its behavior depending on where we are on the uh, on the change room but we'll talk about that on thursday so all right well um i i'm uh, i'm glad you guys are enjoying this uh these these dialogues i find them absolutely fascinating so uh we'll pick up where we left off on uh on on thursday so thanks everybody bye, bye for now. Now. bye all okay, bye, bye.